Oh, welcome aboard. This is the Passball Show brought to you by JohnPLA.com. Happy to be with you on Thursday, the 30th day of November, last day of November as we get ready to hit the month of December. And we got, obviously, everything going on with your, your holiday wishes, whether it's shopping, whatever holiday you decide to celebrate um, in advance. Certainly want to wish everybody, a, you know, a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a Happy New Year as we finish up the year of 2017. And I'll tell you, uh, we go through this every year, but it's amazing that we're about to enter December, and another year is pretty much almost in the books. Lots of stuff I want to get into, and we could talk about stuff that I've brought up on the program before. We, we talked about Eli Manning. I gave you my opinion about the Greg Schiano situation. And if you are interested in any of that, you want to comment and throw your opinions back at me, please check out some of my past videos here on Periscope, Facebook Live, or on YouTube. Um, I threw my opinion and basically let it know how I felt about the Greg Schiano situation in Tennessee, Eli Manning not no longer the starting quarterback with the New York Giants, and I feel that some of my opinions go against the grain of what you hear out there and you see on your regular television and radio. So I do think there's views on it that I think are a little polarizing, but I also want to let everybody know. Hey, your opinion matters too. So if you want to be part of the program, you can call in. The number is 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. Um, I've focused a lot on this program over the last month and talking about really ways that we could all try to do a better job of getting ourselves closer, unifying the people of the United States of America because I do think it's something that's very important. And I've thrown a lot of things that we really are neglecting. We are treating each other regardless, you know, whether you're a white male, whether you are a minority of any sort. You know, it seems like it's, you know, the white male against any sort of minority or any sort of difference. And the bottom line is we've all gotten to a point where we've all put ourselves in categories and groups. And whether you're judging people based off of their difference, we put them in a group. And if we are not judging people, we put ourselves in our own groups, which in fact is judging people. So I just think sometimes we have to hear that back a little bit. And start to analyze the way that we treat others, the way that we have, in some cases, segregated ourselves to say that we are so different. When the bottom line is we really are all the same. God created us all equal. He didn't create us to judge others by based off of what they look like. He didn't create us to categorize ourselves in a different group and say it's me or my group against the world. So I did want to get into some polarizing topics on this program, and I, I am very interested in talking about down the road. I want to talk into my views about criminal defense attorneys. I want to talk about teen mom. These are a couple things that really do mean something to me to have to voice my opinion about. And over the course of the program, as we're going to be with you Monday through Friday, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, we're going to touch on things like that in addition to baseball and the rest of the world of sports. The thing that I want to touch on today has to do with something that is very polarizing because you're seeing and hearing about it on the news day in and day out. And that's sexual harassment. Sexual harassment can be defined probably in a bunch of different things or a bunch of different ways. There's more pronounced versions of it when you talk about sexual assault and you talk about rape. But now if you see some of the stuff that's going on, you're finding out that a lot, of, a lot of women are standing forward and finally having the courage to discuss things that happen to them that are not acceptable. And the bottom line is they never were acceptable. But I'm going to preface what I'm saying by talking about 
one of the reasons that we've gotten to where we are with sexual harassment. And somebody may, you know, click on their, their Facebook feed or go on social media or turn the news on. And it seems like every day or every week we're hearing about another celebrity that is being called out for sexual harassment. In some cases, there are things that have happened right within the last couple days or last couple weeks. And in some cases, you're finding out stuff that happened years and years ago. So my preface to this whole thing is that sexual harassment was never okay. It wasn't okay 20 years ago. It wasn't okay 30 years ago. But we hit a certain point in society where the dominant males in entertainment or whether they held the political office or whatever sort of power that they were able to hold over a woman, whether a woman was a secretary, whether a woman was working for them, whether the woman was an intern. The bottom line is the woman was in a very weak position because of where they were and where the person in a higher power was. And we talk about male dominance and, you know, I'm not going to ever say that that's right in any way, shape, or form. But we have to acknowledge it's something that has existed for a long time. And stories that you could hear from women 30, 40 years ago are probably more gory and disgusting than some of the stories that you hear nowadays. Once again, doesn't make any of it right. But... The problem is, is this has been a pattern of behavior that is built up for a certain amount of years. And I do applaud all the women out there that are, are standing up and deciding that sexual harassment is not acceptable at any workplace. It could be a mediocre, regular nine to five job, or it exists on Hollywood, exists in politics. There's no way that a, a male should ever have the feeling that they could use the power, their domineering instincts as an animal, to their advantage at any time. And going back 20, 30, 40 years ago, this was something that was way too common and was not acceptable then, is not acceptable now. So I applaud all the women that are standing up and saying, you know what, this was some behavior that happens towards me and it is not acceptable. So I want to call out the person that's doing it. You'll find that some people, you know, different gauges of it as far as using their power over women. And then there's some that probably isn't as big of a deal, but does need to be called out. I think there are some instances where a woman will call sexual harassment. They should always feel like they have the right to do that. But it doesn't make them right in every case. And I'm going to make an example. If you have a single man and a single woman that happen to work together, one maybe, you know, maybe the male has a, a certain sort of power ahead of the woman based off of where they rank, let's say in a company, let's say on in Hollywood. A male, part of what they do is they, they're they interested in a relationship. And I'm not saying every single case is like this. I'm making the one rare point, the one rare exception. A male is courting a woman and a woman is not interested, that, under no stretch of the imagination, can ever be twisted to be considered sexual harassment. There has to be a line drawn somewhere. Now, if that male, male continues to pursue it, and that woman feels uncomfortable because he, he has heard the word no, has gotten the point that this woman, under no circumstance, is interested in that man, and continues to pursue it, then yes, that does get to the point where we're talking about sexual harassment. But a simple man courting a woman or asking a woman out and finding out that she is not interested does not constitute sexual harassment. 
obviously there's different levels. There's asking for favors. There's obviously sexual assault, which involves any sort of touching. You know, if you're trying to kiss a girl that's not interested in you, yes, that is sexual assault. Obviously, if there's anything that involves any sort of sexual contact, you're bordering rape. And in all cases, these things should be dealt with accordingly. But I'm sure, just like everything that exists in this world, there's exceptions to the rule. There's exceptions to the rule when somebody says that they are sexually harassed. There's some cases where a, a woman calls it for it to be a sexual harassment, and it really isn't. And obviously anything that involves any sort of contact or involves something like it's border, borderline assault or borderline rape, there are no exceptions to. That's, those are things that cannot be done in any instance. Uh, made, former Major League infielder Brett Boone, who was a guest on the past ball show years ago, caused a little bit of a stir with an insensitive comment about somebody that was sexually harassed. And we have to get to a point where no matter how many times these issues come up, we have to understand that everyone is an instant an instant in a certain situation that needs to be handled on an individual basis. So just because 20 women have claimed sexual harassment against 20 different men, no woman should ever feel because it's out there so much that it's been called out so many times that they can't address their individual situation. But it doesn't give somebody the right to say it just for the sake of saying it. If I look at a woman, make eye contact with them, that woman shouldn't feel like they have the right to say that I sexually harassed them. We have to put everything in the right context and understand that each individual situation is different. We are, in some cases, having people's careers ruined by sexual harassment. And like I said, once it borders sexual assault or rape, that's something completely different. That should not be tolerated under any stretch of the imagination. But we can't have a situation where a woman feels that they are in a situation where they can't call it out for what it is. But it doesn't mean, once again, that any woman can say whatever they want. Because, once again, I've mentioned a lot on this program, I talk about the court of public opinion... You have to take a step back and realize what it is that's going on. Question whether or not what you're about to accuse is legitimately what it is. And understand that there's another person involved in this. And if whatever it is that you're saying is false or stretched out a little bit or fabricated, you're going to take somebody else's life down with your own. And once a charge has been put out about somebody in a court of public opinion, they have to defend that, whether they did something wrong or not. And I'm all about somebody that did something wrong being held accountable for what it is that they did wrong. But I just think that we have to use the proper understanding of, of, of how what we say or do will impact that person. And like I said, if it's cut and dry, if it's black and white, if this person was 100% wrong, then understand that what I'm saying does not apply to you. I support you and your right to get justice for something that, that should not have happened. And like I keep going back to stuff that happened 30, 40 years ago, there was a time where women did not have rights, which is unbelievable because it should have never been the case. A man in such a high power of a position should not have that type of power to be able to say and do things to a woman that they shouldn't do. And like I said, this is before we even get to the more obvious and heinous things of sexual assault and rape. There's the other side of it too, 
where we have women over the series of, of years that have committed sex acts involving superiors with the intention of moving up. And that's not, that's not only wrong for the man to ask for that, but it's also wrong for the women to do that for that reason. And I understand there's pressure involved where you feel like you're going to lose your job. You feel like your career is going to be over. Your opportunities are not going to exist anymore. But we're now in a society where people have stood up. These other women that have stood up against you know, bad people who have done and said bad things and have put women in bad situations, they've stood up for you. And I've said all along, sometimes it takes somebody to go out there and make a case and maybe deal with the public outcry against them and go through stuff neg negatively to make it easier for other people that are in similar situations. But I think every situation should be handled independently. But it doesn't give people the right to call out for things that are not true. And like I said, you ask a girl out on a date and they say no, that's not sexual harassment. And women who feel like they can advance their career by performing sexual acts on superiors are making the situation much worse and are making things a lot harder for other people. And you're also embarrassing yourself, by the way. Now, if you ever feel that you have to stoop that low to do something like that, to move up in a company you work for, or to get better opportunities in your line of work, maybe you should think about a different line of work altogether. That's all I have to say about that. Once again, John Pielli, happy to be with you on Thursday, the 30th of November. Once again, 732-364-3598. If you're listening and you want to get your voice heard, please. Give a call to the program, once again, 732-364-3598. Tiger Woods shoots a 69 today in his return to professional competitive golf. And I'll tell you, this is something that I, I'd hate to say it. I know professional golf has gone a long way. You know, people follow the majors like they follow, uh, you know, other sports on a regular basis, the popularity of professional golf and it being a spectator sport has really grown very much over the last 20 years. And a lot of it has had to do with the success of Tiger Woods. So Tiger Woods, going back on a course, shooting a, a very good round of golf is something that is is has got to be very good for the sport, but also good for the fans of the people that follow it. We know Tiger Woods is a very polarizing figure no matter what it is that he's doing, either on the golf course or off the golf course, we know that just about everything he does is going to be followed by the media. Because it, it had been a very long time. You look at the greats of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, the Jack Nicholas's, the Arnold Palmer's, the, you know, the, you know, even, even in recent years, the Phil Mickelson's and the Nick Faldo's, you know, none of them were able to generate the level of interest that Tiger Woods has been able to generate. So my hope is, is that he goes out there and can compete seriously on the tour somewhat, even if it's at half the level that he competed in his prime. Few people have dominated the sport in a way that Tiger Woods has dominated golf. And I know it's been a while since he was at that level, but I'll tell you, I'd sign up tomorrow to get half of the level of Tiger Woods is where he was in his prime. Because he makes every major tournament interesting if he could go back to playing the major tournaments. There's been a lot of very good golfers, the Jordan Spieths, the Roy McIlroys. Obviously, you look at some of the some of the professional golfers that have won some of the major tournaments. They're trying to make a name for themselves too. And I understand Tiger Woods brings with it the sideshow. Because he brings with it the extra attention that other professional golfers, even professional elite golfers, do.
do not. But I tell you, this is great. I'm going to follow this tournament over the weekend, and I'm curious to see how he finishes out. I mean, he shoots a 69, which means tomorrow he has a very good chance, unless he completely falls on his face, to be in it come Saturday and Sunday. And hey, maybe he could win the tournament. Maybe he could finish pretty close to the top. But any competitive showing of Tiger Woods is going to give a lot of people the indication that he's back. And, and I, I hope for his own sake that he is. I know he's had to deal with a lot of injuries. I know he's had to deal with a lot of pain medication that he's had to take for his back and his legs and all these other, other things that have been ailing him. But he's been no different from any other professional athlete. You have a chance to compete when you're 100%, when you're healthy, when you're not dealing with any defects or anything fighting against you. Yeah, you have a chance to reach your full potential when that happens. But all of a sudden, things get compromised when you when you have to deal with injuries. And obviously, Tiger has had some painkiller addictions that he's had to fight. And it looks like, and obviously we're all talking about only one day of golf, 18 holes. It looks like he's finally at a point where he can golf competitively again. And I think that's great for the sport. Yeah, it's obviously great for the Tiger Woods fans who get to come out in drones to, to support him again. I'm curious to see. You know, Saturday he is, you know, within a, a you know, striking distance of this tournament. I want to watch him play around the golf. He is a polarizing figure, but he's also been one of the greats to ever do it. Watching Tiger Woods is like watching Michael Jordan in his prime. You know, it's like watching, you know, Barry Bonds or Derek Jeter. It's like watching LeBron James. And I hope we could see that level of competitiveness out of Tiger Woods again. Because it's great for the sport, but it's also great for all of sports. Obviously brings more attention to golf, but anytime you have an athlete that has superior skills or at some point has shown they've had skills that cannot be competed with, it's great to see that person dominate. And when we talk about team sports, I think the same applies to team sports. When you have the New England Patriots do what they've done over the last 17 years. When you've had any one of the Yankee dynasties, whether you want to talk about the older ones, the 36 to 39, the 49 to 53s, or the teams of the 60s, the teams of the 70s, or the teams of the 90s, you're talking about a team that has been able to sustain greatness for a long period of time. The Bulls of the 1990s are certainly on that level. You can look at the Celtics of the 60s and 70s and what they did with Bill Russell. Hockey, you got all those Montreal Canadian dynasties. You got the Islanders. You got most recently the Red Wings. You can even talk about the New Jersey Devils when they had those three championships, three Stanley Cups within a 10 year period. For team sport, it's very hard to sustain it. But you're also counting on a lot more different people. You're also counting over the course of different years to be able to make adjustments, bring in different players. In some cases, bring in different coaches that can provide a different voice. But now, when you talk about an individual sport, it takes a lot. Because the person that has the most control over that success is an individual. It's not a team. You could say that person could be managed well, surround themselves with good people, but in the end, the performance of the individual is the equivalent of the performance of a team. There's nobody there to pick up the individual when the individual struggles. He either succeeds or he fails. He can't get help from somebody else. He can get a voice. You know, if you're talking about Tiger Woods in a, in, you know, in a, in a, tournament playing four rounds he can make different adjustments over the course of the rounds but in the end if he golfs a bad round of golf it hurts him it hurts his team same thing with professional tennis you could you could be playing at your best and he could go up against somebody that's playing a little bit better 
Team sports, yes, they're contingent on a lot of things. But they also have more things going for you in regards to balancing a team when it's struggling. Like I said, a team can get better coaching. A team can get better players. A team can have a star player not playing at its best, but can get help from secondary and tertiary players that are there to help out. Somebody can raise their game up a little bit to make up for the star player that hasn't raised his game on that given night. But when we're talking about great accomplishments, I'll tell you, somebody that dominates the sport of professional golf or the sport of professional tennis has to do it all by himself. And for somebody to sustain success at the level that Tiger Woods was able to do it is something that needs to be respected, something that is respected, but something that makes a lot of people want to root for with the hopes that they could see that level of play again. And I'm no golf expert. I'll be the first to tell you that. But I'm sure there's a lot of people that are analyzing Tiger Woods' round of golf today. They've given some very good reviews. Obviously, you, you score 69. It's you know that that's a very good round of golf. And for everything that he's been through, I think he's got to be proud of himself. Can he do things a little better? Maybe, especially when you're self critiquing yourself which I'm sure any individual that has success in anything individually does. I'm hoping for the best. I'm hoping that he could compete well in this tournament. But most importantly, I hope that he's well enough that he could compete in other tournaments down the road, can compete in major tournaments. Because obviously it's going to bring a lot of fanfare. It's going to bring a lot of attention. But it's also going to bring out the possibility of can this guy do what he did in the 90s in the early part of 2000s again. Can he play at that level? And I tell you, I'm rooting for it. I know there's people that are rooting against it, but there's also there's a lot of people that would like to see this guy compete at that level. And you know what? The top golfers that are out there on the PGA Tour, I think they want to see the best of Tiger Woods too. Because you know what? If you get this guy competing at that level, the level that he did, and I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if he could go back to competing at the level he did in the 90s. But if he is almost at that level, it's going to raise everybody else's game up a little bit. And it's going to raise the level of golf that's being played on the course when we're talking about these smaller tournaments, but then down the road, the majors. Once again, John Pielli, happy to be with you. 732-364-3598. We're live on Periscope. We're live on Facebook. And also, right after the program, we'll download a video to YouTube. Um, other things I do want to talk about. It's funny. I'm going to hit a couple small baseball topics for this reason. The baseball offseason has been slow. We know about the major things going on, the possibility of Giancarlo Stanton being traded, and there's day, day in and day out news about that. Shohan Otani, the Japanese pitcher who's also a hitter, we know he's listening to offers. So at some point, some teams are going to talk about their seriousness, and they also want to sell Shohan Otani on what the experience is going to be like and why he should pick their team over the other 29. Then again, we have free agency. There's some high-profile players that are free agents right now. Eric Hosmer, Mike Moustakis, Lorenzo Cain, all of the Kansas City Royals. You have pitchers Lance Lynn and Alex Cobb, uh, relief pitchers Wade Davis and Greg Holland, and so on and so forth. Problem is, there's been no traction or any activity going on with any of these players. Major League Baseball has its own network, MLB Network, and they're on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They have to have their studio shows. They have to have their regular daily shows. Has they, have they finally hit a point where there's little to nothing to talk about? Sure, you could rehash Stanton. You could rehash Otani. You could talk about the top free agents who, by the way, are not close to signing with anybody. 
Or we could talk about the couple moves that have been made. Do you want to spend 20 minutes talking about the Rangers signing of Doug Fister? The Oakland Athletics signed Yosmero Petit. Do you want to spend 20 minutes analyzing that? And I always talk about this because all four sports, the major sports, have certain times where the season is out. And you talk about the time that you're playing, which lasts, whether it's six months or three months or four months, depending on the sport. You have the playoffs, the postseason, the championships, and then you have the offseason. And for the ideal sports fan, in this case baseball, you want to start out in late February and in March. Talk about spring training, do your previews, get into the season. The season starts in April, goes all the way through to the end of September. And then after September, you have the postseason. So the rounds of the playoffs lead off to the World Series. And after the World Series, you crown your champion. You talk about a, a recap of the season and who dominated and the reason that the World Series champion is what it is. As we hit the halfway point here on the Pass Ball Show, the Cuckoo Clock, once again, we're at you Thursday, the 30th day of November, last day of November, 2017. This is the Pass Ball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com. I'm John Pielli. Happy to be with you. Once again, the phone number if you want to be part of the program is 732-364-3598. So once again, cap in a baseball season, you get to the World Series, you crown your champion, you hit the little bit of a lull as free agents start to declare. You talk about moves that all the different teams can make to get themselves better. The offseason is in full effect. You have your announcements, you have the adjustments that are made to your team. You get into the time where you analyze who had the best offseason. What team is in the best position to compete for the next coming season. And then you get back into February and March. And so on and so forth. Usually, and if you followed the postseason, you know, right after the awards, you saw the general manager's meetings and all of a sudden you saw traction. You saw some teams signing free agents, some teams making trades. And at this time last year, you had a lot more activity than you have right now. So, all of what I've said has come to this one point. There's nothing going on in baseball right now. Absolutely nothing. And I feel bad for the MLB network because you have analysts and show hosts that are being compensated very well that need something to talk about. And they could keep rehashing the things that they've already talked about but we've actually gotten to a point where there is nothing to talk about. And, may, and maybe that's a conversation piece in itself. How the offseason has gone slow. And you could actually get to the point where you could say it really isn't baseball season. Even for the most die-hardest of baseball fans, there is no baseball season going on right now. There is no activity. We could talk about why. I don't know why. I'll be honest with you. Is everybody waiting for Giancarlo Stanton to be traded? Is everybody waiting for Sean Otani to sign his contract with his next team? Are Major League Baseball teams really waiting for that to happen before they start to retool and set their own teams up for what they want to do next season? There should be 30 teams in, interested in Otani. So I think that makes a little sense. But I'll tell you, there's far from 29 teams that have the resources and ability to trade for Giancarlo Stanton. So from that aspect, I would expect to see teams more interested in signing free agents, more involved in dialogue, and more offers being thrown out there. And maybe I'll walk right in to the glory part of it while I'm down in Orlando at the baseball winter meetings. At some point, it has to start. But right now, there is no baseball offseason. And the baseball teams, by making moves and retooling and setting their teams up to compete in 2018 and beyond, they have control over that. So, up until now, there's nothing to report. Moving on, I wanted to talk a little NBA today. If you look at 
the performance of some of the teams in the National Basketball Association. We've spoken, and I talked about it earlier in a week, how there's 82 games in the NBA season. Does it take 82 games for the cream to rise to the top? And if you look at where we sit, 21, 22 games in, you're starting to see the better teams start to separate themselves from the teams that aren't so good. In the Eastern Conference, you got the Boston Celtics, who obviously had that big winning streak. They lost their last game. You have the Cleveland Cavaliers, who have won nine in a row. They've gotten themselves back up towards the top of the conference. The Detroit Pistons, who have some talent, but the critics have said they don't have the ability to sustain the start that they've gotten off to. The Toronto Raptors. And then you got some surprise teams. You got the Philadelphia 76ers, the Indiana Pacers, the Milwaukee Bucks and their Greek star. The New York Knicks are over 500. Then you got the Washington Wizards, the Miami Heat, the Orlando Magic, who got off to a good start, the Charlotte Bobcats, who got off to a good start. Bobcats have lost nine of their last 10. They were seven and five. Now they're sitting there four games under 500. And he got the teams out in the Western Conference, the Houstons, the Golden States, the San Antonios. Sleeper teams that are getting better, like Portland and Minnesota, and maybe even Denver and New Orleans. And then he got teams that had a lot more expected out of them, like Memphis, who just fired their coach, the Los Angeles Clippers, but most importantly, the Oklahoma City Thunder who went out there and made moves, got themselves better, got themselves some more talent around Russell Westbrook, and they've struggled. They added Paul George. They added Carmelo Anthony. And they're sitting there right now at 8-12. and 12. And this was a team that got themselves into the playoffs with just what Russell Westbrook by himself last year. We're talking about a series of games that haven't gone so well for them. Is that an indictment on their team? No. But all of a sudden, the Vultures are going to start to come out and say, hey, does this team have the ability to compete with the likes of a Golden State, with the likes of a Houston or San Antonio? Obviously, Golden State is going to be them against the field until the field can produce a suitable competitor. The last three years, we've talked about Golden State versus Cleveland. Golden State has won two of the last three NBA Finals against Cleveland. Is Cleveland that number two team? Well, listen, they've won nine in a row. They've gotten themselves straightened out. They're playing very good basketball. I think until they're knocked off in the Eastern Conference, they should be considered the favorite to get to the Finals. It's going to be interesting what to expect between them and Boston this year. Obviously, with Kyrie Irving playing for the other side. Kyrie Irving has stepped his game up. And maybe, in hindsight, as we look back at it now, it's probably the best thing to happen to him. Obviously, when he asked to be traded, he wasn't asking to be traded to Boston. So when he asked to be traded, he could have been traded anywhere. And what's to say a team like Boston would have even been interested or had the tools and pieces to make a deal? But the one thing I wanted to talk about, we've talked about for years, the dominance that the Western Conference in the NBA has had over the Eastern Conference. It hasn't really applied this year. And I understand this, we, this is, we've been off to a little bit of a slow start. We're only talking about 21 games into the season, so a little more than one-third I'm sorry, one quarter of the season has been played. And once again, over time, the cream will rise to the top. But the biggest thing that I want to point out that I don't know how much it's been touched on. If it has been, I apologize. Like I said, on the past ball show, I like to bring different caveats and different things going on that don't get spoken about as often as you hear on mainstream radio or mainstream TV. But the Western Conference seems at this point a little bit inferior to the Eastern Conference. But that doesn't mean that the top teams in the Western Conference won't dominate the top teams in the Eastern Conference. I still take 
Golden State, Houston, and San Antonio over Cleveland and Boston and I guess either Detroit or Toronto, right? Is that it's hard to define. If we're going to take three teams out of East Conference, who would that third team even be in the Eastern Conference? But when it comes to the fifth team, the sixth team, and the seventh team, and the eighth team that are all on pace to go to the playoffs, you have nine teams in the Eastern Conference with winning records. You only have seven in the West. And I understand when we talk about you know, the emerging teams like Minnesota and Portland, who I think are getting better, I think at some point could give one of the top teams a run for their money in a postseason series. I know when you're talking about 6, 7, and 8, you're talking about Denver and New Orleans and Utah. And in the East, you're talking about Indiana and Milwaukee and New York. So in both cases, you're not talk, you're talking about three teams that almost, to a point, except for the fact that they have to play the games, have little to no chance of advancing very far in the postseason. Does a team like New York, who's sitting here at number eight, have a chance in a seven-game series against Boston or a five-game series against Boston? The answer is probably no. Could it happen? Yes, anything could happen. So when we're talking about Indiana, Milwaukee, and New York, all sitting there barely over 500, and in the West you're talking about Denver and New Orleans and Utah, which Denver and New Orleans are over 500 and Utah is under 500, it's probably 12 of one and a half a dozen of the other. So I think the Western Conference still remains more of a top-heavy conference than the Eastern Conference, but I think the gravitational pull has shifted a little bit and you could say that the teams in the Eastern Conference, or maybe the Eastern Conference is a little bit deeper than that of the Western Conference. But like I said, when it comes down to it, how much does it matter? Does it matter that much if Washington can get themselves on the inside as opposed to being on the outside? Can Miami compete with a team in a series? Or that Charlotte or Orlando? Like, like I said, two teams that got off to very good starts, but are struggling now, they come back to the pack. I don't think when you, whenever you have eight teams that are going to the postseason in each conference, you never have a situation where you have eight teams where you're like every single one of them are deserving. And every single one of them can compete with the likes of the top of each of the conferences. You certainly have stinkers that are in there. Teams that just rolled themselves in and happen to barely be playoff teams over teams that aren't in the playoffs that you could say are on the same level. But that's one thing I wanted to bring up. It looks like the competitive balance has gotten a little bit stronger in the Eastern Conference than it has been in recent years. Does that mean that some of the worst teams, when we're talking about the Chicago's and the Atlanta's and the Dallas Mavericks, all teams that we've seen be perennial playoff teams in recent years. You know, Dallas has won an NBA championship within the last decade. But obviously those teams are still bad. But I do want to give props to some teams that are starting to step up in the NBA. Some teams that have built younger cores. You know, the Minnesotas, who obviously traded for Jimmy Butler, but have developed a lot of very good young players. They're sitting here at 13-9. The Philadelphia 76ers have had top or close to top picks in each of the last several drafts, and they're starting to see some fruit from their drafts. Is this a year where we could see the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Philadelphia 76ers put legitimate competition out there in a postseason series? I'm intrigued by that. And honestly, when we spent so much time talking about a top-heavy NBA that is setting itself up for maybe the fourth year in a row where we're looking at an NBA Finals which is going to consist of the Golden State Warriors and the Cleveland Cavaliers until we're proven wrong. I'm interested in seeing the basketball that's played in Philadelphia. I'm interested in seeing the basketball that's played in Minnesota because they built very good young cores. And there's a chance that if they put it all together, 
they may be able to compete with the likes of a Cleveland or a Golden State. And I'm rooting for it. I want to see the National Basketball Association to become a little more diverse than it is. It's extremely top-heavy now. Last year, we looked at it and we decided, all right, how many games is the NBA Finals going to be? Not who is going to play in it. Not analyzing the top four teams in each conference, saying what their strengths and weaknesses are, and saying in the end which is the best team. It was assumed that it was going to be Golden State. It was assumed that it was going to be Cleveland. I want to see Boston give Cleveland a run for their money. I want to see what a Toronto or a Philadelphia or a Detroit has. Not just on an individual game, but their ability to compete in a postseason series. And I want to see if Houston has finally gotten it together. Chris Paul is there with James Harden. I know they're sitting there at 17-4. and four. And, But I would say what they have in common with the Boston Celtics is we're talking about regular season champions. Teams that have not proven that they could do it in the postseason. So it doesn't matter how many wins the Boston Celtics finish with this year. It doesn't matter how many wins the Houston Rockets finish with this season. It's only going to matter what they do in the postseason. And you know what? If they get to the seventh game of a conference finals, you could say that that's progress. But if they get matched up in a conference semifinals, if it's a Boston-Cleveland, if it's a Golden State-Houston, those other teams that had those great regular seasons, the Bostons and the Houstons that I'm talking about, are going to have to step up and win it. They're going to have to win a conference semifinals over one of those teams if that team happens to get in their way. It's not going to be acceptable if they lose and not get to the conference finals. And if they if they take on, if Boston takes on Cleveland and loses an epic game seven, they had a good season. And the same thing could be said about Houston against Golden State. But outside of that, at some point, they're going to have to advance themselves. And in doing so, it might be having to take out one of the Giants a little bit early. Once again, John Pielli, happy to be with you. I'll throw the phone number out one more time. 732-364-3598, anything that's on your mind. Got to talk a little basketball, got to talk a little Tiger Woods. And open the program today by talking about sexual harassment. So if you missed any part of the program today, uh, the program will be obviously available. You can rewind it, listen back after it's posted, whether it's on Facebook Live or over Periscope. And within a couple hours, we'll get a video out on YouTube with a nice transcript. And that's what I put it down there. Every single show that I've done since we've re-energized the past ball show, it, it is a transcript that describes just about everything I talk about in the program. And if there's a point or something that I mentioned that you want to hear a little more about, you got the ability to scroll up, scroll down. You can find it in there. I'm not going to clickbait you. I'm not going to throw something into the transcript that I didn't talk about, have you look for it and not be there. I don't care about your clicks. I want, I want you to listen to the program. I want you to be involved in the program. But I'm not obsessed with getting you to click for the sake of clicking. I want you to click because you enjoy the content. I want you to click because you want to be part of the program. You care a little bit about my insight, whether you agree or disagree. And trust me, I'm going to do everything I can to get you to disagree with me in some cases. Not every case of sexual harassment is legitimate. And people's lives and their livelihoods are put in danger when there's false claims. I'm thinking as we move on a little forward, once again, baseball, we could talk baseball all day, but I'll tell you, MLB Network's having a hard time right now. Yeah, they're, they're spending 20 minutes talking about Yosmero Petit. I mean, can he help the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim? Probably. He's a good signing. He's emerged as a pretty good relief pitcher. 
But man, do you really need 20 minutes to talk about Yasmero Petit? Jim Johnson and Brad, Bo Brad Boxberger just got traded today. Is that worth devoting a whole segment of the show on? Right now, we've hit a point in baseball where there's officially the offseason. Other sports should probably take some preference. Maybe it's time to talk a little more NFL. Maybe it's time to talk a little more basketball. Let's talk a little bit of hockey right now. New Jersey Devils made a trade with the Anaheim Ducks. Trading Adam Henrique to the Ducks in exchange for a defenseman. And I think, I think this trade certainly does help out both teams. Sammy Votnin is coming to New Jersey. Adam Henrique has spent a lot of time with the Devils. And if you're a New Jersey Devils fan, you probably you know, got a chance to appreciate him over the last several years. But I think Vatanen certainly helps the Devils' defense, makes them a little bit stronger. And let's be honest. I mean, this is a team that, at this point in the season, is certainly overachieved. They're doing a lot of good things there. And if you follow the New Jersey Devils over the last several seasons, you've realized they've played some very uninspired hockey, but also have lacked the talent that a lot of other teams in, in, in their conference and the league have had. Now, at this point... They're sitting there at 14 and 10. And another thing I'm going to get into, when I'm talking about records in hockey, please stop with the 14, 6, and 4 crap. When you're saying 6 and 4, you're talking about 10 losses. I understand overtime losses will still get you one point, and sometimes an overtime loss or the amount of overtime losses that you had could be the difference between you getting into playoffs and not getting into playoffs. But, for instance, the Carolina Hurricanes are not an over 500 hockey team. They're really 10-13. and 13. They're not 10-8-5. and five. They, don't have ten, they don't have 10 wins and 8 losses. They have 10 wins and 13 losses. And I just wish we would describe that a little more. Put your record in there what it is. The Carolina Hurricanes are 10-13. and 13. Put that as their regular record. Mention after that they have five overtime losses, which is given them because of that five extra points. But stop trying to deceive people, maybe deceiving even the players on their own team. The New York Rangers are not three games over 500. They're one game over 500 because they have two overtime losses, which, by the way, were really losses. They lost those games. I understand by going to overtime or going to the shootout, you collect that one extra point. But the fact that you didn't win still means that you lost. And I know that sounds redundant, but I feel like we come to a point in hockey that it has to be explained that way. If you didn't win the game, you lost. If you lost in a shootout or you lost in overtime, you still lost. Let me know if anybody's there with me. Let's change the record for the wins and losses that you have. And you want to make that third third column mean something, it should. Like I said, the overtime losses or the shootout losses do provide an extra point. But you still lost the game. We'll be back with you tomorrow, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern. Once again, you want to listen to any of the content of the show today. We talked about sexual harassment. We talked about Tiger Woods. Talked a little bit about baseball. And we broke down the conferences in the NBA. So happy to be with you. We'll be back with you tomorrow, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern. Stay tuned. The program will be available on Periscope, on Facebook Live, and also on YouTube. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you. On the other side.